the last class, period. This has been a lot of fun. I will do a little wrap up at the end, but, uh, and I feel like a sneeze is going to come on some in, sometime in the next few minutes, so bear with me if I dab out for a minute. One of the things we haven't necessarily talked about, um, and what was interesting and challenging about designing this class, is that I normally have around 15 different lectures on roughly 15 different topics that I would try to get in in the semester. But in a class where we only meet six times, and we meet um, for about a little less than half the time that I normally meet, I've had to condense and figure out, OK, what do I not keep in this particular syllabus? One of the things I thought was important, though, we've talked a lot about the system overall, wrongful convictions, capital punishment. Uh, but we haven't necessarily talked about what's it actually like to be in a facility as an inmate, all right, that male and female experience of being in prison. Uh, and so by, I conducted a lottery of sorts to determine what would be my last topic to talk about today. And that particular ball came to the top in terms of what I thought was most important to kind of leave you with, uh, give you a slight glimpse for those who um, may not be as familiar with what actually happens and what goes on in a prison. I do understand that some of you likely visit the death row unit at, at, at Riverbend, and so you may have some relationships there. Um, but that general population uh, and, and the day-to-day -day operations of prisons, the prison subculture may be a little bit different. So what I'm talking about today is uh, to get into some unique differences as it pertains to the male prison experience as well as the female prison experience, uh, what are some of the ways in which they differ, uh, what are some of the unique ways in which they're the same, uh, to kind of give you a better understanding of what people actually, who you may help or may service when they come out of prison, I think it kind of helps to an extent to understand what they went through while they were in prison to better service their needs when they come out. On the male prison experience side, and, and this pertains to an extent to the female prisons as well, we have this term called prisonization. Um, prisonization is another way some people will say, uh, you may have heard people say such and such is institutionalized, or they have a difficult way of, of breaking that pattern. In some cases, that's an extreme case of prisonization. Prisonization is a term that was coined by Donald Clemmer, uh, who's a researcher who published a book called The Prison Community in 1940. And he co coined this term, and what it essentially means is it's the process by which an inmate adapts to or one the, adapts to the process of adopting the mores and customs. Basically, you got to learn how to do prison. You got to learn how to survive in prison. So every person who comes to prison, if it's new to you, all right, now, and we're not talking about the repeat offender who's been there five, ten different times. They kind of know the ropes. But somebody new in, you got to learn how to do this, right? Um, and to some regards, prisonization is a lot like socialization into the culture of the prison. Okay? And there, we'll talk in a second about some of the very specific things you have to learn. But prisonization is one of those things that is necessary to successfully participate in prison society. And it's also one of those things that kind of ensures the continuity of the prison subculture. So as people come in, they learn how to do this, and then you continue on. I tell my students as a comparison that we have variety in terms of the general cultures of this college versus that college and so forth. And that, and the way I really got them to understand this was this concept. I asked them how many of them had to adjust to Vanderbilt culture when they came to wherever they came from. And students from the Northeast uh, had a drastically different experience. They weren't familiar with Southern customs at all, so they, they had a, probably the most to learn. And so much like you have to learn something about what it's like to be in college, you got to learn that similar what it's like to be in prison because that culture is bigger than you, it's been there before you, and it will likely be there after you. Okay? Um, prisonization, like socialization, is an educational process. And again, they learn these cultural norms through social interactions. All right? So by engaging with other people, you come to learn what they do. One of the things that they may have to learn, anybody ever heard of this concept called the convict code? There's this concept referred to as the MA code or convict code. Um, this is something that dates back pretty, pretty far, and essentially is a set of informal rules and values that regulate individual behavior. All right, these are informal things that you got to learn. And unfortunately, in the prison environment, uh, ignorance is, is not an excuse for violating a norm of some sort. You're kind of expected to know these things, and when you don't know them, you put yourself in harm's way. Okay? Um, the MA code, which is one of the original things, and, and this varies from place to place. All right? there's, there's different variations of it, but from an academic standpoint, uh, what academics have been able to 
Dean from their subsequent interviews with, with inmates in terms of what are these rules that govern what you do. Here are some of the things that, get, that they come up with. One of those is that you don't interfere with the interests of other inmates. Uh, use the example in class, I tell students all the time, uh, if pick two students on the front row, if one of them in, the, in front of everyone else in the class got up and just cold cocked the other one, and, and they're severely injured, when the, police, when the officers come in and say what happened, nobody saw anything. Because you don't interfere in the interests of other inmates. You know, classic examples, in, in some cases, other inmates will simply walk away to not even be able to have seen something. All right? So that's kind of a cultural norm. Another thing is you're expected to show your, show your loyalty to other convicts, not prison staff. So if you're an officer and you're in a prison environment and you want to be buddy-buddy with inmates, that won't go over well. Because from the inmate's perspective, if I'm a new, new inmate and I come in and I'm seen whispering in the corner to a correctional officer, then later that day somebody else's cell got raided and they found some stuff they weren't supposed to have, what do they think? They think I snitched. Right? And so you'll see strange things. And I tell my students this on tours. They may see something as strange as an officer approaching an inmate and may ask something as simple as, how's your day? And this person yell out loud, I'm doing fine, sir. Why do you think they're yelling? So everybody else can hear what you say. And they know you're not telling something not supposed to, not supposed to be telling. Again, where your loyalties lie. Okay? And as an officer, if I know this, if I want to mess with you, I can put out, I can try to make it look like we're friends. I can hang around your cell. I can leak the information that you might be a snitch. That's the way in which I can psychologically victimize you. I can torment you in that capacity. But that's something that I can always hold over you. Okay? We also know that you're expected to not be nosy. You know, do your own time, mind your own business. Researchers also tell us that you're expected to be cool, not lose control. On the inside, you may be crying every day, but when, you, when that cell pops open and you walk out that yard, you can't show it. You gotta be very stoic. You gotta present as if this world does not bother me. There's a saying in prison that tears run backwards. How do your tears run backwards? <coughs> hmm? They run backwards when you're in your cell at night and you're laying on your back and you're crying. You won't, you won't cry out in public. You can't let people see that. But when, at night when I'm in, in my room or my cell and I'm laying down and the reality hits me of what I'm missing, what's happening in my family because I'm here, that's when it hits me. That's when I allow myself to be vulnerable and be, be emotional or whatever, but I'm not going to do that out in, out in public during the day when I'm standing upright and to let somebody see me cry. If somebody sees me cry, that's a sign of weakness. I may potentially set myself up to be preyed upon. Okay? Um, you're also expected to keep your cool, never show signs of weakness. I'll talk later, there's a whole lot of masculinity tests, the ways in which people test you to gauge how, how manly you are. All right? and, and some of these tests are, are very simple tests that my students would fail more miserably because they have no clue that they're actually being tested. Uh, one, I tell them all the time, if this is a hypothetical another inmate, and I'm an inmate, and I come up and Stand right here. How's that a test? I have, I, I'm not, I have very personal space issues. If I, if I ever run into any of you out in Kroger, you will observe that I always keep at least a shopping cart between me and anybody behind me. <laughs> but in prison, it's kind of the same thing. For me to, for another man to allow another man to stand this close to you, that says you're weak. That says that you're, you're, not, you're not comfortable with telling me to get away from you. Then we go one step further and I say, hey, how's it going? And if I just tap you on the shoulder, I touched you. That's another masculinity test. Uh, there are some other blatant ones. When you first come to prison, you got a nice pair of shoes. I'm just going to go take them. And I'm going to gauge your reaction to it. If you, ooh, I'm telling, <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just told me you're weak. You just told me you're comfortable with people taking things from you. But if you react in a more aggressive fashion, you kind of confirm and define who you are as a man. And so all of these things, uh, there's another one that comes up. Uh, there is the expectation that you don't take advantage of, there are certain protected categories of inmates. All right? Fortunately, today we have special populations, like at uh, Lois DeBerry Special Needs Facility, 
where if you're an inmate with a physical disability, uh, severe mental disability, uh, we transition you to a place where you won't be in general population. These are some of the original basic tenets that inmates live by. Unfortunately, what happened over time was we had this transition from what they call the old con system to this more modern inmate subculture. And even when we go on tours now, um, my class is always befounded when they, an older inmate will say, I'm a convict, I'm not an inmate. And students look at me like, what's the difference? You're still in prison. But they draw a clear distinction between a convict versus an inmate. Convicts tend to be older. Uh, they followed a different power structure that was largely based on kind of seniority, who's been here the longest, that sort of thing. Inmates are a much younger generation. Their power structure is based more on violence and, in, and the ability to invoke fear and intimidation in people. And so what we had happen was this convict code became se severely revised, or there were some amendments added to it. One of the things I got added was this aspect of toughness, your, your fighting ability. If not your fighting ability, your ability to bark. And I'm not referencing barking like a chihuahua, but barking like you got, you got to be able to, <laughs> to argue your way, talk your way out of a situation. All right? Talk a good game. Um, also, loyalty became expected to your own racial group. Whereas it used to be we're all loyal to inmates as a unit, now we have severe racial division. All right? The male inmate subculture, I would argue, is probably 30 or 40 years behind society with regards to race relations. One of the things that struck my class when we went to Riverbend about a month ago, we went into Unit 6, where uh, they actually have the pictures of the inmates that, are, that, that live in each cell. And going into the class, I gave my class the assignment, find an interracial cell parent. I'll give you extra credit. Nobody could find one. Because in most cell arrangements, a black person lives with another black person, a white person lives with another white person, Hispanic, Hispanic. It's very common, although prisons, like we have rules that say, you know, we don't necessarily uh, discriminate or segregate. Inmates will self-segregate self because they're largely divided along racial lines. All right. Uh, you will have some extreme, some outliers that will kind of go against that trend, but the general norm is that people are highly segregated. It also became more the norm that extreme forms of violence became accepted. All right. Uh, it wasn't enough to simply harm someone or get into a fist fight with somebody. Uh, it became a lot more violent, a lot more graphic. We had a lot of maiming, for example. A big thing is to cut someone with a razor blade in the face. And tell my class, why do you think that is? Why do you think it's important? Or why do you think this practice of maiming or cutting someone in the face popped up? I'll give you the answer. Uh, for the rest of that person's life, every time you look in the mirror, it's a constant reminder of what someone else did to you. And so prisoners can think at that level. Not only, like for me to punch you, and we get into a little scuffle, you may heal out and go away. But when you have this scar that goes from here to here, that's a constant visual reminder that you gotta deal with on a daily basis when you look in the mirror. And so when you have certain, po certain pockets of the prison environment that subscribe to those types of extreme violence norms, it can make it very difficult for one, rehabilitation, success at reentry, and those sort of things. Uh, there are some universal aspects. Somebody tell me, what do you think you would have to learn if you went to prison? Something you think you'd have to learn. How to do. Just one thing. Detach. Hmm? Detach. Detach. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely would certainly have to do that. Uh, learn to be comfortable in a relatively small setting. Uh, it would bother, I'm, I'm very claustrophobic. I would throw that out there. Uh, that would bother me, like just having, sharing small quarters. Um, one of our researchers, Donald Clummer, gave us a list of things that people actually have to, from his academic perspective, learn how to do broadly defined. One of those, you got to gain knowledge of the informal prison structure. The formal prison structure is easy. That's who's the warden, who's the deputy warden, who's all these different things, who's the treatment staff. Uh, the informal prison structure is you got to learn who controls the yard, who sells drugs, who's the, who's the most violent person in here. Now, who controls this part of the exercise yard? Because you don't know these things, you wander into, you take, a, take an aerial shot of, say, San Quentin in California, and you see that the blacks run the basketball court, the Hispanics run the, the handball, the whites run the, the Aryan Brotherhood, rather, runs the exercise equipment. And you wander out thinking, I got necks on the basketball court, and you don't look like them, no, you don't have necks. All right, you're expected to know these rules because it's for your own safety. Uh, so learning the informal prison structure is important. You also got to learn to be comfortable with and accepting an inferior role. I've seen the biggest and baddest of inmates who have to bow down to the commands of 
the smallest of correctional officers. You may have been high power attorney, you may have been whatever in the outside world, but in here, anybody with that uniform out, on outranks you and can tell you what to do in a heartbeat, and you gotta do it. And unfortunately, I've seen some officers basically flaunt that in the context of a tour, uh, doing what my parents would call, quote unquote, showing out, where I had an officer attempt to give an inmate a penny because he knows that any form of money in prison is contraband. And he's basically flaunting his power and status in front of this inmate, in front of this tour group who's there watching us. He could have made that point without necessarily trying to hand this person a penny. Um, but you have to be comfortable and learn how to accept and inferior your role. You also have to develop new social habits. If you are a social butterfly, uh, you can't be a social butterfly in prison. prison. You can't go around, hi, my name is such and such, I'm in for, who are you? Uh, that, that's probably not, <laughs> you will not have, uh, prisons are not social hour, okay? Adapting new social habits may mean that even if, for example, I was brought up and raised with the notion that when you make eye contact with somebody, you speak, you acknowledge their presence. Well, walking around making eye contact with people in prison is not a good thing. People think you're plotting on them. People think you're up to something. You can't stare at people for a long time in prison. Okay? Um, so you'd have to adapt and learn some new social habits. You also have to adopt various survival techniques. For some, this, this boils down to seeking a job where I'm not in close proximity to others because I don't feel comfortable around other inmates. So if I'm, if I'm borderline skittish about being this whole experience, I'm not going to work, volunteer to work in a cafeteria where I got to see every single person come by us, versus I may try to be the warden's assistant, the chaplain's assistant, or something along those lines to where I'm in a much smaller environment. Survival techniques also have to deal with shanks. Have you ever heard of a shank? You have to learn how to make a weapon for your own security. River Band, if you ever go there on a tour, um, they have a nice little, I guess, shank wall of fame where they, <laughs> where they show various shanks that, of things that they've confiscated over the years from inmates. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, genius stuff that's been created. One of the assignments, actually, I used to do it in my Vanderbilt class. I stopped doing it after uh, we had an airport incident. Um, I, I used to have my students, for extra credit, make a shank. And I said we had an airport incident because they did this over Thanksgiving break and tried to fly back with it in their luggage. Uh, and so we stopped doing that after that. But, and it was quite frightening, actually, what these students came up with. Um, but it shows, like, Inmates have 23, 24 hours a day to, to think about these things. And so some of the things that they come up with are pretty, pretty genius. Um, adoption of a new language. You gotta learn how to talk to prison talk. All right, this goes back to that, your bark ability, your ability to kind of talk your way out of situations, to sound like, to blend in in all capacities into this new environment. And these are the five factors that at least Donald Clemmer argued were important to get a person to be able to, to that mental place where they can effectively do prison. Unfortunately, and, and I didn't get, I pulled out a lot of slides out of this particular lecture because I, I would then talk about the roles that inmates take on because not everybody does prison exactly the same way. And depending on the role that you take on, that impacts the degree of prisonization that you experience. If you take on a more outlaw type role where you, you, you say screw everybody, your prisonization tends to be pretty high, even at release. And so from a prisonization standpoint, there's different roles where the, the, when you're at release, your prisonization is pretty low. And when you understand kind of the role that a person took on and how this impacts their degree of prisonization, it kind of gives indications for who's most likely to be successful even at reentry. Because if somebody's come out just as high as they went in, in terms of prisonization, they're gonna have a difficult time adjusting. Versus somebody who started pretty high and then gradually just came down by the time they were released, they've basically been reformed. They've changed to an extent. We'd Have there anything, any services within the prison system that prepares them to come back to prison? They do have, um, we have various treatment programs. I would tell you one of the things that I'm not a fan of is the fact that we really don't make a concerted effort to line up participation in treatment programs with release. And so what you may actually have is you may have an inmate who takes GED, anger man, takes all these classes, they're serving a 15 year sentence. They do all this stuff in the first two or three years of their sentence and then basically are warehoused 
for the next 12 some odd years. And then they may step down to a uh, minimum security facility, say three to six months before they leave. Uh, but a lot of the, the maximum bang or benefit of some of these rehab programs was ga gathered early on, uh, especially when we put them in like therapeutic communities. Uh, Tennessee Prison for Women used to have one, I think it moved to Mark Luttrell. Well, you put them in a therapeutic community which, which is designed to kind of help people get off of drugs and, and kind of live clean. And yeah, it is good to put them through that in the first half of when they get there. But if you do that in the first year of a 12-year sentence, and then you got to go back out into the general population. Uh, and I will tell you, in general population, any drug you can find on the street, you can find it in there. Uh, and so if I'm, I just did this one-year rehab program, and then I go back to general population for the next 12 years, where, again, any drug that I had on the street, I got equal access to it in here as well, uh, the odds are of relapse, so odds of maximum benefit from their program are minimized. We do know that there's some things that work to minimize prisonization. Uh, for one, serving time in, in smaller or serving shorter sentences uh, tends to be one of the things that somebody who's in there for a year or two versus somebody who's doing 20 years. Okay? We also know that having a pro-social cellmate, you typically tend to be involved in whatever your cellmate tends to be involved in. All right. And this kind of uh, when I read this one all the time, I think about uh, one of my dad's sayings. He used to always tell me as a child, "You hang around stupid, you get stupid." And that was his favorite saying. All right, you hang around stupid, you get stupid. I didn't understand it at the time, <laughs> but I get it now. Right? Uh, and to an extent, this kind of applies in the same capacity in prison. All right, you typically tend to be involved in whatever your cellmate's involved in. We also know that having a stable personality. Having a stable personality in terms of having a firm sense of who you are and not allowing yourself to basically be let go and, and, and live in this world kind of thing. And there are some inmates who intentionally do that, who will intentionally live in this prison world and cut themselves off from the outside world. And sometimes that's inten intentional because when, uh, if I'm here for 20 years in prison and it emotionally, psychologically, and physically drains me, every Sunday when I got to go to the visitation gallery, see my mom, see my kids, see everybody cry about the fact that daddy's still here. And couple that with the fact that any time I have a visit, I gotta be strip searched and all these other dehumanizing experiences. I may decide it's a much easier road for me simply to say, you know what, don't come visit me anymore. I'm, I'm fine, I'll just, I'll write you guys, but don't come visit me because every time you come, it's psychologically draining on me and I gotta go through the dehumanizing experience of being strip searched and all of that before I go back to myself. Um, so there's different ways in which people handle and process that, but depending on where you are with your personality. Also, maintaining contacts with non-criminals from the free world. So if you are a person that visits Riverbend on a regular basis, uh, your presence may simply be affirming to somebody to realize that you know, they can't actually hang out and be around other people who are not criminal. I'm making an assumption that if you go out there and visit, you're not criminal, so hopefully that applies. Um, but for some people, when you have these contacts for, with the free world, especially people who may say no you before whatever bad choice you made, all right, that becomes a constant reminder of who you really are. Even though you may allow, attempt to allow yourself to go, let go and live in this environment, when you know, family and friends come up and they remind you, like, what's with this new look? When did you get this? They can remind you of who you really are. Uh, so the more you can do that, the, the better in terms of increasing your chance of not let, completely letting yourself go. Avoiding deviant activities within prison. Uh, rejecting the norms of convict society. I'm gonna go through this last couple pretty quickly because it's not a whole lot here. Serving time in small treatment-oriented facilities. Uh, there's certain facilities that are larger than others, and the, and the general norm or general custom culture of that facility may be more, uh, you know, lends itself more to the negative aspect of prisonization. All right, versus, you know, Riverbend has a certain normative cultural norm versus West Tennessee the West Tennessee State Penitentiary. All right, drastic difference. To the point that I tell my students, if I'm ever unfortunately caught up in some trumped up charges situations, I want to do my time on the low side of Riverbend. I've been to every prison in the state of Tennessee. The low side of Riverbend, or low, the very special needs facility, are the two easiest places to lay down, as you may say. And by lay down, it means you just find a nice, comfortable spot where you can do your time. Um, the general culture does tends to be one where it's not as violent, it's not as uh, overly run by gangs, it's not as depressing as some of the others. It's still in prison, but it's not as bad. Uh, we also know that lower levels of security and high levels of exposure to the outside world also impact that, your ability, your degree of prisonization. As a male in prison, 
All right, I mentioned earlier that one of the things you've got to deal with are what we call these masculinity tests. And these masculinity tests, are, 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 they vary in scale, they vary in scope, but they all kind of got the same consequence. Fail one, and you open yourself up to future attacks. You open yourself up to be manipulated and taken advantage of by others. Uh, at the key forefront, a lot of this is your sacredness as a male, what it means to be a man. Uh, officers will even tell you. They have to be keenly aware of how they interact with inmates. Even though I have a great deal of power and superiority over you by my title and position, I'm keenly aware of the fact that what I put out is what I'm going to get back. So if I treat you with disrespect, that's what I'm going to get back as disrespect. So I'm going to tell you, if I treat you like a man, you're going to treat me like a man. I had an unfortunate case of a young lady who uh, was a correctional officer at Lois DeBerry Special Needs Facility. I remember when I took my class out there about 15 years ago, um, she shared a story with us about how when she was a rookie correctional officer, she made a very unfortunate mistake. When she, she believed that she had to come in and be a very authoritarian figure in terms of how she interacted with the inmates and was very aggressive. All right? um, and, and given a directive to an older African-American male inmate, I think this guy was like 70 years old according to her description, uh, she told him to do something quickly, but then added the word boy to the end of it. And so in that context, he didn't perceive she was treating him as a man, and he reacted very violently. And so again, and she has a slight hitch in her jaw from where he actually turned around and hit her. And I have other officers that will tell you, like, I'm always keenly aware of how I treat them is how they tend to treat me, because at the end of the day, they still have this concept of themselves as a man. And what you will and won't let somebody else do to you, or how you will and won't let somebody else talk to you, you kind of got to be mindful of that. Uh, you have a, the sacredness of your reputation as a man. You got to protect, you're expected to protect your reputation, any slurries upon your reputation. Um, realizing that in prison, they have a formal system. You could go to the D board, you could file a complaint and go to the D board, or you can take care of justice on your own. And most inmates prefer a more private, vengeful justice, all right? Because again, going to the D board is a sign of what? Weakness. Weakness. So even though I may have, it's like somebody may have cold cocked me in my eye, and I come out of my cell with a nice little black ring around my eye, and an officer approached me and said, what happened? I, I just fell. I hit my head, face on the edge of the bed or whatever. I won't say somebody punched me. But in the back of my mind, I know that I owe this person for what they did to me. And there is a very, there's a very long memory of folk in prison. All right? Krista Pike, the lone female that we have on death row, uh, she also picked up an attempted murder charge in her time in prison. Her attempted murder charge that she picked up stemmed from a situation that she had with a young lady in county jail five to ten years before she actually ended up on death row. She never forgot it. And she had a situation that came aroused to where she had a chance to seek vengeance, and she sought it by trying to strangle this person with a, shoe, with a shoestring. So it makes have very long memories. Uh, a person's fighting ability backed by their superior strength becomes kind of these automatic responses to threats. So when you feel threatened, you got to be able to bark very loudly or bite very loudly, okay? But at the very minimum, bark. Violence does happen in prison. I will tell you that uh, for a lot, a, lot of a lot of altercations in prison, they never really escalate to all-out violence, okay? Violence doesn't happen as much as you may think from television, but it does happen. Um, Specifically, we have assaults that happen in prison. Rape is a reality in prison. This is one of those topics that not a lot of people like to talk about, but it happens. Uh, I spent the better part of a year traveling to every correctional facility in the state of Tennessee for the sole purpose of investigating PREA, which stands for the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Uh, I was hired as a consultant by the Tennessee Department of Corrections. I was given access to disciplinary reports. I had to interview every warden. I uh, had to interview four or five correction officers at every facility, uh, and also surveyed inmates, all under the realm of discussing and exploring the extent to which Tennessee had a problem with rape in prison. Um, and, and I will tell you, it happens. And what was really sad is that I had some wardens who knew it happened, but would, they were, kind of had this good old boy mentality. It's like, well, that's the cost of coming to prison. Whereas others who may have been a little more progressive would say, not on my watch sort of thing. 
Uh, but, and there was some, like, I was very quick to get out of that facility before it got dark, uh, kind of thing. Murder, uh, despite what you see on TV, all right, it doesn't happen as frequently. All right? The number one cause of death in prison is actually illness. Much like in general society, the number one cause of death in prison is illness. And more specifically, the number one culprit is cancer. So homicide, I believe, is number three on the list in terms of what tends to actually kill people in prison. We do have a difficult time actually measuring prison violence to, to tell us more accurately when we, the true extent of the problem, in part because um, a lot of our measures, from the, count, the only thing that we can actually count are disciplinary reports. The correctional officers are right. But inmates, we've already determined, are less likely to actually report to an officer because it's a sign of weakness, which means that we're going to be grossly underestimating the, the true extent of the problem. Um, a few key factors associated with prison violence, money. While inmates are not supposed to have money, I guarantee you if you did a thorough shakedown at Riverbend right now, you might come out with about $10,000 in cash, at least, when money is considered contraband. All right? Inmate money is money that they have on their books. Nobody's supposed to carry cash. Okay? Um, funny story, one of my, I remember one, one of my tours years ago, despite me telling all my class that, uh, you know, don't bring this, don't bring that, I had a student show up with like $197 in cash. I was like, did you think they had a gift shop? Um, <laughs> And had to, <laughs> I had to explain to him that uh, they will not let you in with this money, so we need to figure out where we're going to put this money at, because you can't go into the facility with $197 in cash. Um, the academic term for the underground market that they have in prison is called the sub economy. The sub economy is where inmates, the underground market, where you can purchase all sorts of stuff. Drugs, uh, cell phone, uh, my cell phone, I have a 5S, Apple, or iPhone. I can go to Riverbend and probably find somebody that has a three or four version newer model phone than I own that just came out last week. Contraband is, is, is always in prisons, right? We can probably do it. There was a one point, maybe about three years ago, News Town of Four kept doing these I-Team investigation series where you had inmates that had like Facebook profiles and they were Facebook Live. And Facebook Live means that you are standing there right at, at the present time. <laughs> doing, and so if you have a Facebook profile and your Facebook Live, and we can clearly see that you're in a correctional facility. And that's problematic. And so Commissioner Schofield, actually, uh, former commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Corrections, uh, he took that very personal. He started doing more shakedowns and, and, and so forth to try to catch it. Inmates are always one step ahead. And they're always one step ahead because of who else is involved in this. Who else is involved? Guards. Officers. All right. Most, a lot of the big stuff that comes in, a lot of times it comes in through officers. Gangs is another big problem. Um, yes? So the officers are not They are. Uh, they are. They go through a, a search process similar to what normal visitors go through. Uh, in some cases, actually, theirs can be even more extensive. At Riverbend, for example, they have a new, neat contraption where you, they're supposed to step over and it's almost like the been at the airport where it kind of scans your body. They don't do it for everyone though, all right? And one of the things that, a couple of things that factor in in terms of why officers are more likely and more inclined to get involved, one, they don't make a whole lot of money. And so if, if my weekly paycheck is a thousand bucks as a correctional officer, right? And that may be, that's a gross overestimation. I don't think, even think they make that much. But like hypothetically, if I make a thousand dollars a week and Ray Ray, who's a drug kingpin, Ray Ray approaches me and says, hey, I'll give you $4,000 to bring in this package for me tomorrow. So financially, it's a very enticing offering. But then also I know that in terms of the consequences, the worst that the state can do to me in theory is prosecute me. In practice, I'll just be fired. And so if the, constant, the major consequence in practice is this, I'll just be fired, when I really wasn't trying to be a career correctional officer to begin with, this was just the only job I could find, I'll do this as long as I can, and then when I, get ready to get, when I finally get caught, just take my punishment and be fired. So you have a lot of stuff that comes in via correctional officers. Uh, we do have problems with gangs in prison. Uh, gangs tend to exploit the weak. Uh, everybody's trying to make money. Everybody has their own little racket that they're trying to run. Uh, 
And, they, and these things aren't present in all facilities, I will tell you that. Uh, for example, West Tennessee State Penitentiary is going to be a whole lot more gang run and oriented than Riverbend. Doesn't mean you don't have gangs at Riverbend. They're just not as strong, not as actively involved in shaping the negative aspects of the culture. Um, all of this has dire impacts on what we call recidivism. Anybody know what our national recidivism rate tends to hover around? It's almost 70 percent. We know that uh, Bureau, of Bureau of Justice statistics studies have found that uh, one case, one of our most elaborate studies, actually tracked people for a little under 500,000 inmates uh, from 30 different states. Uh, what they found was that about 68 percent of them, within three years of release, were rearrested. Pretty high number. We also find that within five years, that number goes up to about 77 percent. Of those who were rearrested, over half of them were within the first year. So what this tells us is that we have the odds of somebody coming back to prison are pretty high. And so if you have a rehab program that says our, our recidivism rate is 50 percent, that's actually pretty good in comparison to national averages. Okay? Um, we know that recidivism rates tend to vary by the type of offense. When we collectively lump them all together and look at just some of them, by far the group that has the highest odds of coming back are those who are arrested on property charges, burglars, robberies. All right? And the reason I tell people, one of the, things we, one of the stats we talked about earlier, this, this term, was that of all, when you look at all of the crimes collectively that result in arrest, of all the crimes that get reported to the police, what percentage of them result in arrest? If it's only about 20 percent collectively, that means that as a, if I'm a burglar, I burglarized 10 homes, then they caught me. In my head, I know how to do math, statistical odds, you caught me one out of 11. So when I get out, if doors keep slamming in my face, and people don't want to hire me, people don't want me living next door to them, eventually I'm going to go back to what I know. And I figured they caught me once out of the previous 10. I was in prison. I may have learned from somebody who got caught once out of 20 or 30 how to be better. And so I fall back to what I know. All right? I tell my classes all the time, we all play a part in re-entering. And, and un getting, getting students to understand and realize that it's very important that you meet people where they are and not where they've been. Because if you continuously slam doors in people's faces saying, I know you've paid your debt to society, I know you've changed, but I don't want to hire you. I don't want you living next door to me. I don't want you doing this. I don't want you doing that. Then what, what options or choices are you leaving people? Okay. Um, we also know that 76%, 79% rather, almost 77% rather, of drug offenders come back. Um, about 74% of public order offenders come back. Violent offenders tend to be one of the lowest ones, in large part because a lot of times in violent offenses, it's, it's kind of a situational thing. I had beef with one person. Uh, I reacted in an aggressive, violent fashion. I did time for that. The odds, but in some cases, is significantly lower that that person will continue on that path. One other slide I want to show you about recidivism real quick. When we look at men versus women, this is setting up my transition to talk about the female prison experience. Uh, this is from a study that looked at recidivism rates for a five-year period, 2005 to 2010. Uh, just looking at it, so you can see that overall, the rates are still pretty high. All right? We'd love to see something down here. And I heard, you heard me talk earlier about Men of Valor, one of, my, one of the programs that I kind of have done work with in the past. Uh, they've been very successful at getting their recidivism rate consistently much lower than 67%, 70%. I want to transition now and talk a little bit about women in prison. I didn't start the male prison slide with something that I normally say in class. When we think about men in prison and women in prison, academically there's one term that we use to describe each one. The male prison environment, the one term that often gets thrown around is predatory. It's an environment where while it may always it may look calm, may seem calm, there's a whole lot of planning, plotting. Uh, as officers, as volunteers, uh, even when, when I went through volunteer training many years ago at Riverbend, I was told, uh, don't accept gifts, don't do this, don't do that, 
because uh, MAs are basically setting you up. They're always running game, and, and they're basically a, a setting up a situation where you owe them something and, and some type of a favor. So we're always told, like, you know, we were told heavily, be careful and, and, and monitor what you do because inmates prey on or they're, they're cons. They may take, try to take advantage of you. In comparison, in the female prison environment, the trend has always been, or the term has always been, kinship. So predatory versus kinship um, is one unique difference in terms of how we think about the female prison experience. To give you a little background, because much of what I've talked about so far has been about men in prison. All right, but I do want to kind of give some demographics and information about women in prison that I haven't necessarily talked about. Uh, First and foremost, we know that most states then actually began establishing central prisons for women, uh, where we had these early houses for felons that began in the early 19th century, but we didn't have actual prisons until much later. In fact, what actually happened was women used to be housed in male facilities. They may be in a special wing, okay? Uh, but the general norm was that we would simply house women in a, a particular unit or a special wing of a male prison. It wasn't until the 1800s that reformers actually started to push for separate facilities and programs for female offenders. Early on, uh, if you can go back even further to when we had Goyles and Hulks, kind of the early predecessors to jail, men, women, and children would all be housed in same situations. Like today, that doesn't make sense to us. But early on, that's how we housed people. Eventually, we started to see the development and the growth of, of women's female prisons. Uh, the first thing that actually happened was Sing Sing facility in New York in 1839 was the first state prison system that actually converted a wing of their units for women. It wasn't until 1873 that we actually got our first female prison, our first 100% fully dedicated, this is a female facility. Uh, when we had the, in Indianapolis, we had a prison, all female prison opened up. To show you the growth in women, from 1873 to 1973, the first 100 years, of female prisons. We have 42 prisons built. The war on drugs, 1980 to 1990, we built an additional 71 more. So that two decade period alone, we more than doubled the number that we had from, again, 1873 to 1973, we only had 42 female prisons. The decade of the 1980s and 1990s, we built 71 additional ones. All right. The female inmate population is still the fastest growing population in our prison system. By 1977, roughly 34 states actually had separate facilities for women. Those that did not, for example, would simply pay a neighboring state to house their female offenders. So it may be the case that if I'm a female offender in Tennessee, I'm housed in Alabama because Tennessee doesn't have a female prison, so that's where the housing is. Tennessee got our first female facility in 1966, or 1963, when the Tennessee Prison for Women opened up. And prior to that, we were either housing them, actually there was a, a small unit at the walls, that house female offenders, uh, or we were paying neighboring states to house them. Are you going to talk further and extensively about what happened in the 80s and 90s in another point? I, quite, I can't get all that in. Yeah, I can't get all that in, because if this was the longer, where I got 15 lectures and each lecture is three hours, we'd have unpacked all this stuff. Um, okay. A few statistics on women in prison. Most of it was the war on drugs. I will, I will tell you that now. Most of it was the war on drugs. Uh, since 1980, the number of women's prisons has increased by more than 700%. Uh, this has outpaced men by more than 50% in terms of growth in prison. When you look at the total incarceration populations, all right, uh, females comprise roughly 10% when we look at jails and prisons combined. Specifically, when we look at just jail, they make up about 7.5% of the folks we have in jail. They make up about 12.5% of the people we have in, in uh, I'm taking that back, 7.5% in prison, 12.5% of the people we have in jail. In 2013, we had 1.2 million women who were under some form of criminal justice system control. And by under some form of criminal justice system control, it means they're in prison, jail, probation, or parole. All right, we have 1.2 million women who, who fit that demographic. Some of the reasons for why we've seen this exponential growth in our female inmate population one is changes in state and national drug policies that mandate long, longer terms uh, for relatively low drug offenses. So the war on drugs played a huge part. We also saw changes in law enforcement practices, particularly in those targeting minority neighborhoods. And this may get to some of the DEA 
carrots and sticks that we referenced earlier. Um, also, post-conviction barriers to reentry that uniquely affect women. Things like housing. For example, as a convicted felon, in some cases, you, don't, you no longer qualify for public assistance with housing. Some additional demographics about women in prison. Uh, their numbers racially, when we break them down, are very comparable to what we have among men. 48% uh, of women in our state prison systems are black. 33% uh, are white, 15% Hispanic, 4% other minority. 62% um, of women, in comparison to 51% of men, are parent, have kids under the age of 18. So we have a large proportion of female offenders who have to bear what we call the cost of motherhood. All right? Even more damaging is the fact that about 64% of them actually live with their child at the time that they were arrested. You had a child under the age of 18, you're arrested, now the question becomes, what happens with the child? Does a parent take them in? Do they become property of the state with regards to the, the foster care system? Uh, and you can see that in comparison, only 42% of men who were actually in the house with the child at the time of arrest. So women come, in, come into prison with these burdens uh, that are unique to them. A small percentage of them actually come, in prison, come into prison pregnant. 4% uh, of women in state prisons, 3% of women in federal prisons and about 5% in our jails nationwide report being pregnant at the time of incarceration. It also does happen that a, a person will get pregnant two years into their prison sentence. This is not immaculate conception. Um, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we have correctional officers who get involved in situations they should not be involved in. That happens in prison. Okay? Female prisons are all more likely than their male counterparts to have histories of physical and sexual abuse. In the number of years that I've been going to Riverbend, or Riverbend, or Tennessee Prison for Women, but in general, in all of the years when I talk to women in prison, I've identified like one key factor that plays a part in so many of their stories, and a large proportion of their stories, in terms of what ends up bringing them to prison. What do you think that one key factor is? Hmm? Men. Men. Problematic relationships with men, either being abused as a child, physically or sexually, being abused as an adult, uh, being turned on to drugs by a spouse or a boyfriend. Uh, but when you unpack it, you hear a lot of people's stories, and, and other people hear that, and they will hear all these other things. They'll hear drugs, they hear all these other things. But when I trace it back down, <laughs> it's all coming back to some problematic relationship with a man. How did that come up in a ballet class again, Lizzie Boy? <laughs> Lizzie Boy. Like, I'm just, I'm just curious about that. Basically, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I thought it was a new style of dance. I wasn't aware. I was just wanted to make. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, let me get through a few more and then not chime in with a few questions. Uh, women in prison. We know that about. One third of our women in prison are there on property crimes. Property crimes, as defined by the FBI Uniform Crime Report, is larceny, uh, burglary, uh, arson, and auto theft. Those are the four categories. Uh, when we look at what tends to take women to prison, overwhelmingly is larceny and fraud. Well, fraud is a special category of larceny, but you can see that the largest category of property crime offenders for women in prison is fraud. In comparison, only about 2% of men are in prison on fraud charges. Fraud may be, <laughs> is that smart? <laughs> like women get, or they can engage in the smart crimes, men can't. Uh, embezzling the, fun, <laughs> the funds, bad checks, whatever. But fraud is tend, tends to be the higher category. When we look at the, the violent crimes, uh, we know that about 36% of women tend to be in prison on violent crime charges. What do you think is a violent crime that women are more likely to go to prison for? Murder. Murder, uh, murder is the largest category. We know that roughly 11% of women who are there on violent crime charges are there on murder charges in comparison to 13% of men. Is this where they kill men? In most cases, it, can, it, will, it will be. Uh, <laughs> she said, this is where they killed that man. 
Uh, <laughs> drugs, in about 25% of cases, uh, women are in prison on drug charges. The last thing I want to leave us with is talking about and dissecting further the female inmate subculture. All right, just a little bit more about what it's like to be a, a female in prison. Uh, I mentioned one of the things that's uniquely different is in the female prison subculture, uh, they tend to adopt more of this family model. All right, a lot of them, as I mentioned, came from may have come from problematic backgrounds or relationships. Uh, they may not have had the best family structure, so they tend to duplicate somewhat of a kinship network or a family structure within the prison environment. Um, and they also will kind of develop these pseudo families. All right? And when I tell this to my class, and then we go to TPW, Tennessee Prisons for Women, and I hear somebody say, well, this is my sister, or this is my mother, and they're like, oh, they have a kinship network. Um, but and this, this kind of it, is stronger in some facilities than it is in others, and in some is really, really strong in the sense that what will happen is you'll have a group of, say, 10 inmates. They'll basically call themselves a family. You may have a mom, a dad, you may have siblings, you may have grandparents. They basically replicate a family structure of sorts. Okay? And it's, this family structure is very supportive. Uh, it's also unique in that it tends to cross racial lines. Uh, you tend to have fewer racial issues among women in prison than you do among men in prison. Uh, in large part because we tend to have these, these blended family structures that may have a, a African-American female who's a husband with a Caucasian female who's a wife in a family situation. Um, so you have a lot less racial issues. They will have marriage ceremonies, and union, uh, union ceremonies, uh, where they may exchange certain tokens to indicate who's married and who's not. Uh, for example, at one point in time at Tennessee Prison for Women, it was those little threaded bracelets that people were wearing on their wrists. Uh, and one, we went out there one year for a tour, and one of my students had them on her wrist, and she couldn't understand why the correctional officers wouldn't let her go in with that on her wrist. And I, didn't, I, didn't really, I usually try to search them thoroughly myself before we go so that they don't have on anything that will be a violation. But um, at that time, that's what the inmates were using to indicate who they were, quote unquote, married to. And so they didn't let her come in with that on her wrist and she had to cut it off. Uh, we also know that there's a male shortage. What I mean by, I see a few people frowning. Uh, what this means is that in a female prison environment, if there's 100 female inmates and 10 of them, decide to take on the masculine role. That means there's 90 that are taking on the feminine role. These 10 that have taken on the masculine role, because everybody wants to be in a relationship or to feel valued or to feel like they're in some form of the intimate parent, there's a whole lot of competition for those 10 spots. So typically when you have violence in female prisons, it's over a fight over quote unquote someone else's man. That's typically what tends to produce violence among women in prison. And officers will tell you that when they get done doing all the investigation, it usually comes back down to some situation of that magnitude. Because again, the, the deck is tremendously stacked in terms of there's very few people who actually take on the masculine role. But those who do, there's always this competition of people competing for this person's attention. You do have some people uh, dropping the ball that's basically switching teams. You may decide at one point in your time you want to be a a mask, take on a masculine identity. At other points in time, you take on a feminine, ident a feminine identity. Uh, and some people do this as they're transitioning out. There's a term in prison called gay for the stay. But when they talk about gay for the stay, meaning that while I was here, I played this role and I was involved in this subculture because it was necessary for me to survive. It gave me the emotional support that I needed. But now that I'm out, that's something I left behind. Or they may, the transition could be even more drastic that it happens Every Sunday at visitation, when this person's husband or whoever comes, I'm who I am, then I go back into the prison subculture, I'm somebody else. There's different roles, as I mentioned. Uh, some of these roles, some are called butch, stud, fems. There's different titles that get tagged to the roles that a person takes on uh, when they're in prison. These networks can be a very good control over inmate behavior. Officers know, for example, that when an inmate is involved in one of these networks, the mother in that network has more power than an officer does. The officer can go and say, hey, I need you to stop doing whatever. And that inmate turn around and give them all sort of lip. But then this inmate who's quote unquote the mother can say, I need you to stop doing whatever. Do it in a heartbeat. And so for that reason, correctional officers will tolerate that. They'll tolerate the system. They'll tolerate the network because they know that uh, a more effective way for me to control this inmate's behavior is to go tap into that structure and relay this message to whoever has authoritative, authoritative control over this person. 
but it, it can also undermine prison punishments. For example, in prison, a punishment may be you lose your ability to write or send out mail for six months. Well, if I'm in a family and I lost my right to send out mail for six months, who can send it out for me? Somebody else is in my network. If I lost my ability to access commissary, to buy anything on commissary for three months, well, who can buy it for me? Somebody in my family. So to an extent, uh, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. It can be used as a benefit in some cases to control inmate behavior, but also officers realize that in other cases it can undermine the punishments they get dealt out because when you're part of this fraternal or sorority-like network, it always connects you to resources. They don't, however, tolerate sexual behavior within the networks because that will happen as well. Uh, you will have inmates who will attempt to arrange situations or encounters to where uh, they can be in more intimate fashions with their quote-unquote mate while they're in prison, including some who may run interference or run distractions, just all sorts of things that inmates do in prison uh, to create relationships, but officers are adamantly against any form of sexual behavior in prison. There are some key differences when we think about men and women in prison in terms of how they go about doing it. Uh, we first and foremost know that women's female prisons tend to be less violent. It's not that there's no violence, but they tend to be less violent than men. We also know that in these facilities, uh, in terms of how officers tend to interact with inmates, in the male prison, it's a much, much more almost peer-to-peer -peer interaction. The officer realizes what I put out is what I'm going to get back. In the female prison, it's almost more of a parent-to-child interaction in terms of how they interact and how they talk to inmates. Okay? Uh, strangely, I've had officers who will, who's worked at multiple places, and the question will come up when, on the tour. Uh, one of my students will ask, well, tell me all the places you've worked at. And the officer may say, I worked at the Tennessee Prison for Women, and I worked at Riverman. And I'll ask them, which one did you, would you prefer better? I've never heard anybody say I, it was much easier to Tennessee Prison for Women. Uh, officers will, will almost say to, to a T that it's a much easier job at Riverbend than it was at Tennessee Prison for Women. And so we ask why. So at, at Riverbend, if I tell an inmate, I need you to go over there, they'll go over there. At TPW, I tell an inmate, I need you to go over there. Why? <laughs> and, and it comes up multiple times. I, I have to keep constantly explaining why do I need somebody to do something, whereas I can just tell him, man, I need you to do this, and he just does it. Uh, and that's, that's their story, not mine. Uh, we also know that women tend to show a greater responsiveness to prison programs. All right? In large part, they're more likely to participate in them and more likely to at least show signs of got, having gotten more out of them. For some men, participating in programs, again, is weak. Women tend to have more classification by security level within facilities, meaning they tend to be overclassified. All right? For example, at the Tennessee Prison for Women, you have people there doing one year in a day to death. All right, one year in a day to death with Crystal Pike. That's a very broad range of sentences. Whereas for men, you may have a, yeah, there are certain time building facilities where people are here for 25, 30 years, that's one facility. One to six years, that's another facility. Uh, so you, you, can, you can put people in places where the classification levels, they're with other people that are similarly situated. But at Tennessee Prisons for Women, because we don't have as many female prisons, you may literally have a situation where, again, a year and a day to death as we have at Crystal Pike. We also know that female offenders are much less likely to segregate themselves by race. Um, women are also more likely to become involved with, with officers. This happens a lot uh, in, at Tennessee Prisons for Women. Of all the cases of PREA, PREA allegations that I have to investigate, Mark Lettro and the Tennessee Prison for Women, probably 75% of our cases of inmate to officer relations happened at those two facilities. Women tend to suffer greater identity issues than men by the mere act of going to prison. Uh, these sub rosa economies, the markets that these illicit goods tend to be ran out of are different. Males is more of a racket system. Females is more of a sharing based system. Women also have to deal more with the, the brunt of uh, the cost of motherhood, which is why at Tennessee Prison for Women, they have something unique that you don't find anywhere place else. It has a child visitation gallery, where with child visitation, I believe up until age six, your child can actually come out and stay the weekend with you at the prison. You ain't, you're not going to find it in the river band. You're not going to find it any place else. Again, given that women have more of the cost of motherhood at, at Tennessee Prison for Women, uh, one of the benefits or privileges is that if you behave well enough, 
your child can come out over the weekend up to age six and stay in a specialized area of the facility with you. Women also do not have the same spousal following. This is always, always a funny question that I get when I post in my class. I ask the question um, to all of the men in the class and all of the women in the class. I'll say men. I'll start with the ladies first because their answers are typically a lot better. Pose the question, how many of you get married to your spouse, you've been married for five years, you discover your spouse is arrested or that your spouse ends up getting, getting arrested, how many of you are going to stay with them? They've got to go to prison. And ask the same question to the men. Spouse, arrested, you've been married for five years, how many of you stand with them? What do you think those survey outcomes are? The women over here is like, oh, I just, what did he do? I'll stay with him. But I'll be there till he gets out. Uh, the men, <laughs> it's a whole other ball game over here. Uh, they're almost like, as soon as the judge says guilty, it's like, he just broke us up, boo. I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's, a whole, it's a whole different relationship over here. Uh, so typically, when you go, for example, to the visitation gallery at Tennessee Prison for Women, what you tend to have are mothers bringing the kids to visit mom. At Riverbend, what you tend to have are wives or girlfriends bringing the kids to visit dad. So the spouse of following is drastically different. All right? Females are much more likely to stay with the man in prison in comparison to the opposite. All right? um, in the interest of time... Well, it, it, it doesn't bother me, but I mean, it's, it's problematic for them on a lot of different levels that their marriage vows can be just <laughs> simply overwhelmed. And in most cases, like, it doesn't even matter what she, what she did. It's like, it's, it's very easy for them to be like, well, you know what? Like, I take, I take my personal, my vows a little more serious than that, but it's, it's a different generation. I don't know what to say about these kids. Does it matter if they have children as to whether they That doesn't impact this group. This group over here, this group has, they have all sorts of questions they want to know, and, and their, their ranges and limits with regards to the charges, uh, they'll stick through that. Uh, this group over here, I, you've been amazed at just a, I, every now and then I get one man that'll fall on the sword, I'm like, I'll stay with them, and, like, and, and everybody else picks on them, but it doesn't, it doesn't come up a lot <laughs> that we have a lot of folk over there. I'm going to get to this last slide, because I'm going to skip these last two just to get to that slide. I did want to give us some question time, but before I wrapped up, um, they want to say, this is the first time I've done a class of this magnitude. Um, I've been teaching for 15 years. This fall makes 15 years for me of teaching at Vanderbilt. I've also taught classes at Trebekah. Um, I've taught at Trebekah for about three or four years as well as an adjunct. Uh, but my classes have always been, you know, that 18 to 22-year-old range. Um, that 18 to 22-year-old range. And I didn't realize just how, I guess, ununique and narrowly focused they could be. Um, <laughs> Until, take, until teaching this class. Uh, this has been a lot of fun for me. All right, I want to throw that. This has been a lot of fun for me, kind of uh, having the opportunity to engage with, with folks at a slightly different end of the spectrum than the, new, the, the students that I'm used to teaching to. But it, it's been a lot of fun in the sense that I lo I've loved your questions. Uh, your energy, I think, has been very infectious. Uh, and I know that some of you are doing things where you're engaging with these populations beyond the context of this course, which is why I want to give you my contact information. If, there's, if you wanted references as, as far as other agencies that you may want to contact to say, how, how can I get involved? You know, how can I do more? Uh, I have a list of groups that I've worked with and that I've done things with in the past. There's some that I really even I push my students to. I've had students who've done internships with Project Return. I have two students currently on staff at Project Return. They took my class, got, got a passion, Project Return hired them. I had another student who went to work at a company called Dreamweave, where they make purses in prison. She's a former student of mine. So I had Dreamweave come in and give a presentation to my class. She was intrigued enough. Now she's like their associate director of something, something, something. Um, so if you are interested in kind of wanting to do more, wanting to get more involved, uh, there's a lot of different places where you can choose to jump in in terms of trying to make an impact and make a difference. A lot of my impact has been at the back end, the reentry portion, uh, which is why I tell my class, you know, the model that I preach in my class is meet people where they are and not where they've been. Meaning that a lot of people in, his, in life have made bad choices. And I also drive home the, the point that the only difference between the students in my class and the folks at Riverbend, folks at Riverbend got caught. I used to think the Vanderbilt students were all angels. <laughs> then I spent some time serving on the student conduct board, 
I spent some time serving on the provost's committee on sexual assault. I spent some time serving on the Greek standards committee, and I saw stuff, and I'm like, whoa. Including, I'm gonna share one last story with you. When we go on the prison tours, I used to, I, have an ex, I had an expedition that I recently got rid of, but I used to let students ride with me on these tours. And there was one tour, one year we went to Riverbend, and I had, um, it's me and like seven or eight students packed in my expedition going to Riverbend. We pull up to Riverbend because it's on state property. Any vehicle on state property is subject to be searched. And if you've ever gone to Riverbend, you know there's kind of that blind curve that you gotta come around that curve, and you don't know what's on the other side of that curve. Well, we turned that curve, and there's about 50 state troopers, dogs, all sorts of stuff. And I'm just driving because I'm fine. I've, I've never had alcohol all day in my life. I've never put anything in my body. I'm fine. These kids in the car, I've never seen a more nervous group of people in my life. Uh, they started asking me, can a dog smell this? Well, I smoked a joint last night. I was like, Becky. It, it, just, it, just, it took me. <laughs> I was not prepared <laughs> for the stuff that came out of these dudes' mouths. So all that to say, uh, they are not angels. They simply have not been caught. Uh, and that it's not our place to pass judgment on people who've made a bad mistake. All right, we all make choices in life, and we all got to be given a second chance to recover from those choices. So I applaud all of your efforts for what you do with regards to trying to be a part of the solution. And if I could ever help you with anything that you're trying to do in the future, please feel free to contact me. We can do that from there. So thank you. Any last minute questions? I think we do have a few minutes. On the DEA side, um, the DEA does kind of offer financial incentives for certain state agencies or local government agencies um, to increase like their patrols of traffic stops with the goal of discovering evidence of drug, drug trafficking. All right. So which, what that ends up doing is you, you will see a lot of um, unmarked vehicles on the interstate that are not necessarily, excuse me, state troopers. They're, they're drug enforcement officers, or they're local police, local, local government officers that are part of some special drug task force. In addition to that, they actually, in the latter part of the 80s, had Operation Pipeline. Operation Pipeline was a federal DEA program where local and state officers could actually go and learn how to conduct a traffic, how to use traffic stops as a means of further investigating criminal crimes, or drug crimes in particular. So they're actually teaching officers at lower levels how to do this. So in addition to that, offering incentive to do it financial, we're also, we're also going to teach you how to do it as well. Uh, so we've had different ways in which the DEA will, will heavily utilize and heavily incentivize uh, law enforcement officers to get involved in that, to help them in their efforts. Do they give them equipment? Yes, in some cases they can apply for specialized grants uh, to get access to different types of equipment. There's some equipment that I've recently discovered where they can actually monitor the temperature of your vehicle as you're traveling down, like almost through infrared, because uh, when you marijuana pack together, actually it's quite hot. And so they can monitor the temperature, the infrared temperature of your vehicle as you fly past. So, and that's specialized equipment that you can apply for certain grants to get. So don't, don't travel with fresh laundry out of the, dry, of the dryer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think I do. I wanted, I, one of my favorite aspects of teaching that class is that I've had students who are lawyers who I get, all, I get an email almost weekly from a former student who will say, that class changed my life. I see things differently. Uh, I thought I was so far removed from that process of like, they didn't want to go to law school until they took that class. Uh, it's, a, it's a very highly competitive class to get into. Uh, for example, we just had registration two weeks ago. Within the first 20 minutes of registration, that class filled up. And I started getting requests from people. I was like, I can't add you because t Riverbend only lets us take 25 people, so I capped my class at 25 students. Uh, but it's, it, it, has, it, it is a very life-changing class for a lot of students, uh, including so much so that this is not a good example. But we went to Riverbend two weeks ago. We're standing in the capital punishment area. One of my international students from Canada, where they don't have the death penalty, uh, she's, she's been taking this class from, and she's visiting from Canada, and we're standing in front of the electric chair. She fainted. She will never forget that experience. And so when she goes back to Canada, she's probably even more of an advocate against the death penalty as the country is. But uh, yeah, we, we have some very life-altering kind of experiences. We have two more, I see, or three. We'll go here.
grace to behave the world over. And the reason for this is, I sued my mother when I discovered she had raised me with duress. And my good friend and chaplain, the head chaplain in Atlanta, is still in prison. He tells me that a lot of men like me who are in prison, it has to do with unresolved problems with their mothers. And so I'm saying all this to say, I believe that the name of prison should change to adult incubators. I live in the uh, MH house, and I told the manager that what I'm in the midst of are a group of adult babies. And if their parents get the children their medical record, and my minister used to say, before y'all go get on drugs, mom and dad was already taking feet. And that affected me early in the 60s, and I need medical records. And I would like to get your opinion on what you think, how medical records could be used yeah, I, I can talk more about that afterwards, but I will tell you that um, biological or psychological determinism uh, is something that is not heavily, not thought in high favor in academic circles. Because that actually gets you, if, if, we, if we feel like we can go back and look at when this child is born, there's some gene or trait that says they're more likely to become criminal, and we want to choose to end this life now, that sounds a little Hitlerish when you're arguing that somebody is more superior to another. So I, we can, we'll, we'll talk more about it. One point, the FBI is tracing crime back into the womb. And, and maybe I'm just putting this out there and not even asking for it. How are we going to ever get drugs out of this country? Or can we, can we not get drugs out of this country? That is a million dollar question. <laughs> I, would, I, I wish we could. <laughs> I would say that's a million. I, I watch border wars and all that kind of stuff all the time. Like, and when you see the level of stuff that people are willing to do to get drugs in. I, I have traveled and I'm about to go on my sixth visit to Cuba. Cuba does not have drugs. Why do they not have drugs? I don't know. Mm -hmm. They've got hundreds of people coming in there from various I think they will ultimately have drugs, but they don't have drugs there. That you know of. Yes, people know. <laughs> <laughs> One more. Mm -hmm. I asked Commissioner uh, Parker uh, what uh, they uh, did with someone who had been sexually abused uh, uh, there in prison, and he said the solution was uh, solitary confinement. So, so it's kind of one or the one bad thing or the other bad thing when somebody is being raped. Mm -hmm. And I actually, uh, Tony Parker was one of the people I actually interviewed when I did my uh, consultant project. So I know Commissioner Parker well. No other questions? One more. Look at the, the, the school to prison pipeline. School to prison pipeline. There's a lot of disparaging statistics about in the 1990s when a lot of school districts went to these zero tolerance policies with regards to disciplinary behaviors. And there's a strong correlation between students and kids who get kicked out for these various zero tolerance policies and a proportion of them that end up in our juvenile justice system and a proportion that end up in our prison system from there. So when people talk about the school to prison pipeline, that's one of the initiatives. It's one changing that, that dynamic. And I tell people all the time, I wasn't always a great kid, and I still remember Ms. Dotson, my eighth grade, my uh, high school English teacher, who, when I was cutting up in her class, gave me the choice of being written up on a referral or coming and standing next to her and letting her pinch the back of my bicep as hard as she could. And I chose the bicep about 20 different times. When I, pro <laughs> when I, pro I probably, in any other class, <laughs> in any other class would have been written up and with that number of referrals may have, at some point in time, faced disciplinary actions that could have put me on that path. So on, to some extent, it's about that dynamic of teacher relationships, and that takes us into a whole other realm when you look at who are overwhelmingly our teachers, especially in our public schools, and the demographics of the students that they're teaching, and the ways in which you know, we have a mismatch, and that ends up in more people being written up. But I'd look at the school to prison pipeline with the, for answer to that one.
involved in the Boston rehearsals mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. and, and the person speaking said, if society doesn't care yeah. about the people or the children, and they only care about their property or what they own, they should pay attention to children because that will come back. Yeah. And another interesting stat to that point is the fact that while you have a lot of female inmates who have issues with prior sexual abuse or abuse of, abuse of childhood, men in prison have that same thing, which is largely why they, a lot of them are, have been abused themselves. Uh, and when we think about the, I didn't talk in the, about in the MA subculture that there's a hierarchy of, of charges, that if you come in with this charge, you have a little more respect. And at the bottom of that totem pole, if, you are a charge, if your charge is sexual assault of a child or abuse of a child, next is rape of a woman, if you're at the bottom, if, you're, if that's one of your charges, you're at the bottom, you get the worst treatment in large part because a lot of the folks in prison dealt with that. And you become the face of the uncle or the face of the whoever who victimized them as a, ch victimized them as a child. And so there's a reason they tend to end up being punished more severely. I think we have one last question over here. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah right. I'm going to catch her. I'm going to catch her as I'm going to catch her right here. Well, I was going to say my visions, we don't have them, so I don't. Uh, <laughs> my, my, part, I think part of my vision would be in terms of the, the biggest thing I would push for would be better treatment for folks with mental illness and better treatment for folks with, with, as it pertains to drugs. I think if we did a better job with those two, because uh, demographically, while it may show up and say that you know, 20 to 25 percent of people in our state prison systems are there because of drugs, when you factor in how many of them may have committed a robbery or a burglary to get money for drugs? That number goes up even higher. Or you factor in how many of them are there for an aggravated assault or a murder because they con con conducted it while on drugs? That number goes up even higher. So if we did a better job in those two places, we, we should drastically shrink the need for the prison system. We all, we, I, I believe we will always need them. But I also believe in providing services and, and, re, and legitimate rehab opportunities for people while they are there to better increase their odds of success when they get out. I've had family members go through the prison system. And so when I tell people this, this matters to me in terms of the, the notion of treat people, where they, meet people where they are and not where they've been, because I want that for family members that have come out of the prison system. And, and, and to not be hypocritical about that, I try to practice in every capacity that I can. One of my jobs, the director of the Black Culture Center on campus, we recently decided we we're gonna put a barber shop in a basement. When we were looking at who we hire as a barber, I've met three individuals who became cosmic certified state barbers while in prison. They're out now. So I've called all three of them, and they will come work as barbers in this facility. So it's like you got to have a net level of understanding and recognizing that not everybody is, you know, destined to never kind of fix themselves. So you got to provide some type of service while they're there for the few folks that actually need it. But if we, again, with mental illness and drugs, if we did a better job treating those two, from my perspective, our population would shrink exponentially. I've had so many projects going on right now, I don't know what, <laughs> what the next book is going to be like for me. So.